today, as always, we are following the new theme, which is a case study of people's deals. So when you're listening and watching these, please think about the biggest takeaways that you've got from these and email or comment, send them in. Now, today's guest is a bit of a legend, to be honest, and I did a podcast with with this guy in 2017. And even in 2018, I looked right at the end of the year about the most downloaded podcast, even in that year, and it was still this guy's podcast. So Nick Carlisle came onto the podcast in the early days, as I've said, and he was so, so popular. So when I changed the format, I thought, do you know what? I'm going to have to have Nick on. So I'm going to bring him in. Nick, thank you for coming on the podcast video. How are you doing today? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. And um, I think when you call me a legend, it just means that I'm a bit old, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> given how young you are. And um, oh, it's, 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 um, yeah, it's a nice introduction, but I've been doing this a long time, which I guess. Thank you. Well, just, just for the people then who, what, when, what age did you start? I was 19 when I bought my first house. I wasn't really an investor, but that started the journey yeah. into investing. So I was, I bought a house because I needed a place to live and, and I was kind of, um, I was trying to avoid a traditional pension and I just, I didn't really understand it, but I kind of knew on some level that bricks and mortar would be better than traditional pension because of what happened to my dad. Most people know the story of that. Yeah. Fantastic. So, the new format then, is there a deal that, your favorite deal or one deal that you can pick out that you, you'd like to delve into? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've, we bought a lot of property, as you, as you know, probably about 750 properties in the 25 years, 25 years, yeah, well, 26 years now. Um, um, so I thought I'd pick something recent because I think, you know, the market changes, some of the, some of the deals I was doing 10 years ago, you just can't do now because funding has changed. And, and some of the deals that, that I was doing 10 years ago just wouldn't work now. So I want to try and give people an idea of, of, of a recent deal and some of the challenges that we had in it, uh, where we found it. I, I say a lot to a lot of people that, that there's no rocket science in this. Everybody's looking for some magic dust or some silver bullets so i wanted to pick a deal that is you know it's a real deal it's it's a deal we did recently um it's not a deal that is that is beyond most people doing you know principles of how we did the deal could be applied to any deal so i didn't want to pick a deal that that was almost too good to be true you know we, we bought a care home three years ago for 600 grand and sold it for one point uh, six million later, you know, and and they're they're unique deals. They're they're one in a hundred deals. I didn't want to give people that. I want to give some. I want to give people deals that can be done every day. So, and and if you do everyday deals, then every now and again you find the nursing home deal, the care home deal. So, I don't want people to leave thinking, oh yeah, that's great, but there's no way I could do that. I want to. So it's a, it's a fairly vanilla deal. It's a fairly straightforward deal. Um, there's no major massive upside that made us a millionaire overnight or anything like that. It's a real deal that people can hopefully learn from and it, and it, it still exists, we still own it. So, um, Wow. So what is the deal then and how did you find it? So the deal, we're into hotels now and we, 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 we buy hotels for yield as, as you know. Uh, we moved out of buy to let and HMO. So this was our 18th hotel. We're currently at 20, we're at 20 hotels now. We, we, we're in the process of selling a couple um, of the early ones. So this was our 18th hotel and it's a deal, it's a hotel in the Cotswolds called Roxton House Hotel. Um, it has 32 rooms. It has a, a really well-established restaurant and it does a little bit of wedding business, not as much as you might think and there's reasons for that. And we paid a little bit over three million pounds for it. Um, so the reason we bought it is we, we look for three criteria in any deal. And this is, this is one of the takeaways that hopefully people can get from. And this is our three criteria. We believe in them. But I think, I think if you're doing deals or you're trying to do a lot of deals, it's worth trying to establish what the criteria is. Because mm. if you're not clear on what the criteria is, you'll just end up spending a huge amount of time 
on deals that are just you're not going to want to buy. So we we've always been been really clear on what the criteria is when we were buying buy to let. It was double digit yields and a twenty percent discount. When we were buying HMOs, it was um, maximum forty thousand pound per room, where the where the room rates were hundred pound a, a a week. And so by having that, that, it's that first filter. People will have heard me talk about the first filter. It allows you to basically see everything that comes to market very quickly and put most of it in the bin and end up with a maybe pile. And it's the maybe pile that you spend more time on. Because if you look at every deal, there just isn't enough time. So this met our first three, this met our three criteria. So when we buy hotels, criteria number one is we want double digit yield. So we want the, the, the EBITDA, the profit, the earnings, the profit before interest tax depreciation and amortization. So the, the kind of um, net profit before we've really paid for the cost of the mortgage to be at least 10% of the purchase price. Mm-hmm. We're buying a hotel for a million quid. The, the EBITDA, the net profit before, um, before interest costs needs to be at least £100,000. So it ticked that box. We also, it ticked it fairly well, actually. We bought it on an on a almost 14% yield. So because we bought on such a high yield, that means that, that the purchase price, we believe, was below market value. So we got some equity in there, but you, know, you can't spend equity in Waitrose, so it's about income first. The second criteria that we look for, and again, th- these principles are not, are not um, limited to hotels. So buying for yield works in any deal, I believe. If you're a property developer and you're, and you're buying land, it's slightly different, but we're about income first and foremost. So criteria one is yield. Criteria two is can we add value to it? So again, timeless classic of property investing. No new fundamentals here. By, by rundown property, by property that you can add value to. Now, this wasn't a rundown hotel. It was very, very well established, very, very well run by the previous owners who had just reached a point in their life where they wanted to retire. First grandchild was on the way and they wanted to spend time there. So this wasn't um, the kind of deal that a lot of people are looking for rundown, which, which I do like those kind of deals. This was very well established, very well run, probably one of the best run hotels that we've, that we've that we've seen so not a huge amount of upside from the management um, opportunities for us to run it better we've still got the same general manager in there um, who, who will run it for us but there was an opportunity to add extra rooms so again hotels houses apartments if you turn a, a one bed into a two bed if you turn a studio into a one bed if you turn a three bedroom house into a four bedroom house you will generally add value so the previous owners had got planning permission to add eight extra rooms, which is, which is great for us because we can build those. Our, our overheads of running the hotel doesn't really go up. We still need one receptionist, one night porter, one bar manager, one general manager. So we get a better bang for our buck on that. Um, there was a little bit of light refurbishment in some of the rooms, the, 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 the ground floor um, receptions and, and restaurant areas were really good. Um, and then one of the one of the other ways for us to add value, we're, we're oversized now as a group. Where every hotel that we bring into our group, we can add further profit to the bottom line through our purchasing power. So the people that own one hotel buy, you know, a thousand bags of carrots. We buy two hundred thousand bags of carrots. So we buy carrots cheaper, and we buy insurance cheaper, and we buy gas and electricity cheaper. Um, so. Criteria one, double digit yield. Criteria two was add value. And criteria three for us is the ability to recycle our investors' cash within two years. And criteria three is a product of the first two. Because if you get the first two right, you will add value or you'll buy below market value. You'll be able to add value through criteria two. Then you can refinance and that allows you to pull out investors' money. And so that's our first three criteria. So that puts it on the maybe pile. We then go into a whole heap of diligence. And, um, but that's how we filter. You know, we see pretty much every hotel that comes to market and a lot that don't. And, and with that volume of stuff coming at you, you need, a, you need to have a first filter. Hmm, I think that's a really, that is, I mean, every time you, I speak to you, gold is just coming out. Um, and uh, I love that you can't spend equity in Waitrose. Uh, I think that's 
fantastic. But I think having that go there, go, there, go there this weekend, and uh, they call the police. You know, <laughs> I'm going to pay for these when my equity comes. So they don't like that. Yeah. Well, I don't shop in Waitrose. Um, I'm not at that level. You're a kind of guy, are you? Oh man! Do you know what? I've got a shirt and a waistcoat on today. Normally, I've got I've got an event after here, and I've got a lunch and stuff, and I've had to dress up smart, and I feel really awkward. My fiance really? this morning was like, "This is weird seeing you get ready properly." I, well, I'm just in my office at home, so I'm down dressed. So I'd much rather prefer to be down dressed, Nick. Definitely. Um, but that definitely that three criteria that anybody can do that. That is just while you're saying that now, I'm thinking about my criteria and how to, to tweak it, but not a lot of people actually use that. So you are looking for so many different things and you'll hear people and you talk to them. Oh, what, what are you looking at? Well, I'm looking at a little flip to a 10 bed HMO conversion to 80 new builds. And you're like, just pick, just pick a, a niche and just hammer it. It's difficult to try and um, have too many strategies. And it's, mm. it's hard with all the information that's getting fired at you. You know, the, the latest strategy is whatever it is nowadays. I don't even know what it is now. But, you know, I think in my career, I've, I've done three things. So we did, we did HMOs in a big way. Mm. We did buy to let in a big way. And now we're doing hotels in a big way. And, and, and that's 25 years. And, and I have lost money in property over those 25 years. And every time I've lost money in property, it's because I've chased a deal that was slightly off piste. It wasn't really what we should have been doing. It sidetracked me from what I should have been doing. So we spent a lot of money overseas when, you know, 2006, 2007, before the financial crisis when the UK was hard to find deals and what we should have done is we should have just sat tight or yeah. just bought, you know just bought longer term deals but we didn't we went overseas and, and lost money there and um, development development I, I'm not a big fan of but I do respect people that do it but I think the really successful developers do development and that's it they don't they don't get too sidetracked with with too many other things mm. um, you know I've a, I've a, a, a I've, I've got a bit of experience in development. I was a QS, and so, but I, I don't like the, the the guesswork in development in trying to guess what what prices are going to be worth in eighteen months when you want to sell them. I, I, that's the that's the risky part of it. But I do respect yeah. the developers watching this. And yeah, point about those three criteria is just to know what they are for you, mm. um, for the kind of deals you're doing in the kind of area you're doing. Um, and it just, it just allows you to, you know, people say, well, how do you find deals? The way to find deals is to look at more deals, look at more options. Yeah. But you, you can't physically get in your car and look at every deal. So you have to have, you have, to have a filtering system mm. that affects the hundred that might be on the net or land in your inbox or the phone calls you get from an agent to actually, no, that's no good. It's gone in the bin. Or, yeah, that's worth looking at. That's worth spending another hour on. Mm. Otherwise, people just they spend pages and ages trying to find a deal, and then some people either give up and, and think property investing is not for them, which which it's not for everybody, or worse, some people just think, oh well, I've been looking for long enough now, I better just do a deal, and they do the next one that comes along, mm. and that can lead to a whole heap of pain. So mm. but that first filter, that criteria, is is crucial. Mm, fantastic i think that's i've been writing some notes down as well while you're talking so how how did this one come about how was it found then obviously it's got through that criteria <clears throat> again um no rocket science it was an agent so 90 percent of the deals i've done the 750 or so deals have come through agents you know everybody's out trying to find off-market deals and and you know, I make this joke about where do you find them? Is it like offmarketdeals.com? And if they found their way to offmarketdeals.com, they'd be on market deals, wouldn't they? But yeah. most of the stuff comes through agents. Most of the um, most of the deals I've done, most of the good deals come through agents. And so you have to have awesome relationships with a handful of agents. You don't need you don't need it's impossible to, and you don't need relationships with every agent but you do need very good relationships with a handful of agents and, and the agents that are going to 
that are in the market for the deals you're going to do. So in any town, you know, you're in Doncaster, right? Lincoln. Kim Lincoln. Doncaster. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in Lincoln, there'll be 50 agents and some of them will deal with really expensive properties and some will deal with mm. cheap properties. And you just need to find the agencies that deal with the kind of properties you're looking for. And then within the agency, because you can't build a relationship with a business as such, it's a person. So you have to find the person mm. that you can build rapport with. You take them for lunch, you, you send them a bottle when it's Christmas, you, um, you send them a bottle or some flowers or, or a gift when they do a deal with you. And you just build that relationship so that when they see the next deal, when they're viewing properties, and they know your criteria. This comes back to knowing what the filter is as well. Mm. The agent has to know the filter. So if, if you're very clear on your first filter, you can teach these agents what your first filter is. So when they're walking around the property, they're thinking, well, actually, this meets Ryan's criteria. I'll just give him a quick call. Mm. And so the deal may still be on market, but you might get first stab at it. Mm. Or they never get to market because the agent says to the vendor, well, actually, I've got this guy, you know, you want a quick sale. It meets his criteria. I know it does. And, and he acts quickly and he's, he's bought 10 other deals from me. So mm. stop. I would, I would say to people, stop trying to find off market deals, build relationships with agents. It's much more, more valuable. And for quite a long period of time, when I was buying a lot of um, two and three bedroom houses up in Yorkshire, we used to just spend most Fridays taking agents out for lunch. And we try to make a few, few different agents. And some agents don't like you. Mm. Some do. Focus on the ones that do. They've all got deals. Um, mm. And how many deals do most people want to do? You know, we, we, bought, we bought two hotels last year, and that was kind of enough for us. Mm. The year before, we bought six. But you don't, you know, most people are not trying to buy a deal every day. No. <laughs> So you, you need awesome relationships with a small number of agents rather than trying to be shotgun and build relationships with them all. So. And it's good, it's good you say that as well. You know, my best ever deal, that, that exact thing happened. That example there where you said somebody was looking around a property, an agent, and thought, I've got someone for this. So they came out of the property after viewing it and rang me and said, I think I've got something for you. I think you want to come and see this. When I saw it, I was first in the door and yeah, I'll have that. And it worked out to be a, a cracking, absolutely cracking deal. Um, so the way to do off market deals is to do on market deals. Yes. Build the credibility. So the agent rings you in the first place. If he gets a vendor that he thinks, or the, you know, some vendors are quite open. Like, I just want a quick sale. I don't want the neighbors to know I'm selling it. Yeah. Particularly with hotels, you know, everybody that sells a hotel in all of the hotels we bought, they don't want anybody to know they're selling it. Well, how do they sell it if no one knows? They have yeah. an agent who's got a black book of contacts. And, and the agent, you know, it's the human nature. You know, I often say they're lazy. They're not lazy. They're just smart. They're going to pick the phone up to the people that have performed in the past. So exactly. the way to do off-market deals is to do on-market deals first. Yeah. It, that's a cracking quote and you are so right if an agent has got somebody here who they know he's definitely going to buy this or somebody here they've not dealt with who are they going to pick it's sales yeah. they're going to pick this guy it's just easier so my next question is sort of how you knew what to put in the building it was already it was already set up wasn't it so how did you know how to to add the value yeah so so again this was I, I partly chose this deal for this question because I think, again, with property, you don't, you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And um, so this was a well-established hotel. It had planning permission for the eight extra rooms, which we'll start building this year. Um, there's a little bit of light refurbishment in it, but there's not a huge amount to do, really. Um, the business driving the business driving the revenue is more about marketing and enhancing the offering there and so we'll continue to do that but if we look at a different kind of deal for instance a, you know a, 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 a rundown refurbishment property which is a great place for a lot of people to start buy the worst house on the best street and refurbish it i think 
do generally when we used to do those kind of deals, we used to do the minimum amount of structural alteration and we would make it, we would we would put the money into the cosmetic thing. So again, no silver bullets here, kitchens, bathrooms, decoration, you know, door handles, tactile things that people feel when they go around to feel the quality of it. Um, so you don't always have to completely reinvent the wheel with property. Sometimes you can take a, a really run down property in a very good area spend a good amount of money on it and bust through the ceiling price so you get a profit if, if that's if that's the market if that's you know if you're flipping properties if you're renting properties then you know good quality always sells you know people will always pay um higher than you think is achievable and, and all the time across the uk in in hmo sectors and in rental sectors people are busting through the traditional ceiling of or you can only get under pound a week rent for this room and and because of the quality, there are people that will pay 120 or 130. And, and so good quality really is, is, is key. Um, you know, the old budget and Scarpa type mentality just, I think, is long gone. Mm, yeah. Tenants have so much more choice now if you're renting and, and homeowners have so much more choice now. Mm. And you can see that just if you go onto pretty much any social media now, you can see sort of people showing their latest project and they're like, they're blowing everything out of the water. You know, the HMOs look incredible and the way they've staged them and what it's just like, whoa, okay, I'd actually want to live there. Um, so yeah, that is a, that's a fantastic point. So how, so how was this one funded then? <laughs> Again, no, we, we used a bank, so mainstream bank, Cheapest form of funding you'll find. So if you're in buy to let, buy to let lenders are the cheapest form of funding you'll find. Um, so we use the mainstream bank. We have a bank of investment partners, so individual investors that invest alongside us, and we give them a, a nine to twelve percent return on their money, and then we put the bank's money with their money, and we always invest our own money into every deal as well. So we had some challenges with with the first bank who we we'd got a brilliant relationship with. They'd funded three previous hotels for us but because the amount of lending that we'd got with that with that particular bank manager um she she had to step aside and she moved us up to her boss as it were mm. who um i've still yet to hear from you know we've still not heard from him at all and tried to get in contact with him so she pushed us up and, and he just he just vanished i think i think we went from being probably the biggest and most important client for her yeah smallest and least important client for him and so maybe that's what i'm surmising maybe the guy was ill or something so about halfway through the transaction this came to light and we lost the bank that we were going with we quickly went to another bank and they stepped in and, and pulled it off fairly quickly and that with our investment partners and um, our own money we were able to fund it and then through adding the value through adding the extension through increasing the profit we'll look to recycle our investors' money within two years. Mm, fantastic, makes perfect sense. I love, I just, I love talking to you because it's just, it's just real world, real life, and it's just, yeah, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. It literally is just, just this. Just fundamental principles. Everybody, everybody thinks that, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this is easy, mm. but it's a lot simpler than, than maybe people make out it's a lot simpler than maybe some of the people that are selling courses want you to believe you know there's there's power in a network i you know i'm I'm not dissing the educators out there there's some great education providers and i think if if you're starting out or even if you're not starting out it's great to be part of a group mm. i think sometimes there's an incentive to make things seem more complex than they are mm. um you know Banks want to lend money. That's the fact. We want to borrow money as investors. Well, what else do you need to know? Like, if you ring the bank, you know, you, it's LinkedIn. You know, you can find any bank manager of any. You know, they're out there. They've they've got targets. They they've got this money. They they're targeted to lend. They want to lend it. Mm. I always remember my first ever development deal when I was probably. 20 years old and I met this guy, a brilliant guy who remained a friend for, for a lot of years, an RBS guy. And I put together this business plan um, on a, a small development of 10 apartments we were building at the time. And I, 
I met him in, in the Brooklands Hotel in Barnsley. And he sat there over coffee and he went through it with red pen and he said, right, do this, 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 and this. And if you do that, I'll give you the funding. And I thought, well, that, my first thought was that, that's, that, that shouldn't have happened. That, that, why would he do that? Why would, this should be harder. He should make me jump through more hoops. And then afterwards I thought about it and I thought, well, actually, he wants to lend the money. Yeah. I've, got to, I've got to present the right case. So he told me what was missing from the business plan. He told me where the, the gaps were because he wants to lend the money. That's his, that's his role. He's out there looking for new customers. And so it was kind of a realization, but it's, it's, it's obvious, isn't it? So obvious that, and I was sat there thinking, oh, he's going to grill me. I'm going to get interrogated. I was really nervous. I was sweating. I was like, and he's just like, just relax. I'm going to tell you how, you know, I'll tell you if this is not going to work. The development kind of worked. Uh, you know, it stacked up. The business plan was a little bit weak in areas. And he, he just said, right, do this and, and, and I'll give you the money. Yeah, strange enough as well. I, <coughs> I spoke to Lloyd's. So Lloyd's LinkedIn, I think LinkedIn is great for finding whoever you want in this day and age. Um, Lloyd's, I was, I was looking at refinancing and I thought, I wonder what Lloyd's have got on offer. And also getting into some bigger development deals. They were good for development loans. Again, going back to what you said about the three criteria, they had criteria as well. Really mm -hmm. simple. Took him for a coffee and he went, this is the criteria. Um, and then he said, also, oh, your development meets that criteria. And then the interest rate that they told me was great. And he said, I'm just going to give you a few extra tips as well. He said, board out all the lofts, all the attic, board them out. He said, because at the level of house you're selling, you will be asked that question. So he's given me a bit of gold there. And he also said, make sure if you're putting in a big hallway that's got a nice high ceiling on it, make sure you put some good plugs in there, a couple of sockets for Christmas trees. He said, you've got to think mm -hmm. where they're going to be putting the yeah. Christmas tree. And you're like, and I went there <clears throat> quite like, oh, oh God, I'm not looking forward to meeting this bank guy you know he could make or not make or break but it's that kind of mentality he was just a human being he had criteria and like you say he had loads of money he wanted to lend it yeah and and this yeah and, and this is where brokers are good as well because you know dealing directly with banks is 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 good when you've got a relationship but often you don't know which bank mm. you know every bank has slightly different criteria some like your deal others just don't doesn't mean your deal's bad. It's just not within their remit. So having good brokers, we, we use probably four different brokers for different kinds of deals because mm. you, know, you buy to let brokers, you want a really good one of those because that market's moving all the time, new lenders coming in, but he's not the broker that would go and get you development funding. That's a different kind of broker. Mm. Or if you want something really creative, I'm, I'm helping a friend out with a, with a really creative deal on a house that she wants to buy at the moment. And, and so I've got a completely different broker who's uber creative on that. So having a, a really good broker that knows which lenders are in which market is good as well. So because they will assimilate all the criteria, they'll say, well, actually, that's not one for Lloyd's, but Shawbrook will do that because of this. Um, and it's, you know, again, no rocket science. It's, it's, it's not. It's just it's fundamentals, isn't it? That's what yeah. is screaming out to me as we're talking <laughs> is the fundamental. So what, what happened during this deal then when you, you did the light refurb and all those kinds of little bits is the little bits that you did and little bits of, that you added? Yeah. So we, we, one of the main learnings for us is this was a, this was a, um, it was a really well run hotel. The previous owners had recently moved it from a three star to a four star, which, which they were nervous about because they always thought that it's better to have a, a really awesome three star and, and over to deliver to the clients, to the customers, than have a four star that's kind of only just a four star and people be disappointed. So I think they toyed with that decision for a few years, but it's proven to, to really make a massive difference, improve the room rate, improve the occupancy, and it stands up to a four star. But one of the things that we thought when we first went there is this was branded Best Western. Now, Best Western is not. Um, is not generally associated with four-star hotels. They're, Best Western as a, as a hotel group are, are making massive strides. They're doing some amazing stuff. They've got a new CEO who's really forward thinking. And so we were, we were, we were kind of in two minds whether to keep the Best Western brand. Because um, I think most people associate Best Western with 
with more three star, maybe two star hotels. Mm. And so what one of the things we've done is Best Western have a um but but sorry, in the hotel space, you want the the power of the brand to to bring people to you because Best Western have got a, a database of I don't know, millions of people that and they use booking agents and, and so we get a lot of business from Best Western. So one of the things we've done is we've we've debadged the hotel as outwardly Best Western, but it is still a Best Western brand. So ordinary people don't necessarily know it's Best Western, but behind the scenes we still get the power of their networking and their marketing and their their support in driving people there. So sometimes it can be little things like that. And we've seen we've seen massive improvements since then. Um um, the, the extension will make a difference. We're going to build that during the course of this year, so we'll get the extra eight rooms. Um, we're doing additional marketing, um, you know, for, for events, weddings. Um, the, the general manager that was there when we bought it left to go on maternity leave. She comes back in a couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, it's more... It's more little tweaks along the way than any kind of major fundamental rip out and start again. Because again, I wanted to use this deal because to, to kind of make the point that you don't always have to reinvent the wheel. You don't always have to rip everything out and start again. It can be little tweaks along the way that can make massive differences. Mm, fantastic. And going into the wedding uh, market as well, God, I've spent last uh, few months of checking out those kinds of uh, places um which was you're not allowed to roll your eyes when you say that right <laughs> <laughs> well sarah won't be listening or watching this <laughs> uh, to be fair she was absolute she was gold with it she's a chartered accountant and her brain just works like what do we need when do we need it by let's do it and then just goes do 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 so about a week after she, she took, took me to a venue and she was like, this is the one I really love. So within two weeks it was booked, everything was done. But weddings just, they seem to be a, a cracking, it's a cracking business model. I love it. Yeah, I think, I think most people that get married, and I've, I've done it twice, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a feeling that everything you pay for has a, has a premium on it because it's a wedding. So if you went and bought flowers that were wedding they'd be 100 quid but wedding flowers the same flowers cost 120 it's kind of that it's almost like that yeah my perception when i when i get I, I agree with you i quite i i quite like to wind people up though especially sales when they've got a script because i i just love it and it's like i'd like a white cake and they're like what would you like it for i just like white cake i've got an event coming up i'd like a white cake and they're like is it a wedding no i'd just like a white cake and they're like, how many tiers? Three tiers. And just just to see, because yeah. it's like, oh, here's our wedding package. And you're like, oh, gosh. Yeah. Well, but it is, it is, there's a lot that goes into yeah. planning someone's wedding. And I think, you know, the, the, there, there has to be a premium, all joking aside. Yes. Because the, the extra resource that goes into behind the scenes, that you know, you, brides and grooms and their families just want everything to run perfectly smoothly and 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 that does does cost a premium a little bit i'm just gonna put my laptop in right because it's yes no is and you should you should pay for that premium as well. i do i do agree with you there yeah yeah it's a definite you should definitely pay for that premium and it, but it's like anything so what what were the um end results then on this or what will the end results be on this deal <coughs> Sorry, are you there? I just yeah. you. Um, so we've got we've got an income producing asset. It's a great asset. We love it. Um, it adds to um, so it stacks upon its own, but it adds extra value into the group as a portfolio. So sometimes the the um, one plus one isn't two. Sometimes one plus one can be three. So. By, by building a group of assets, hotels, HMOs, vitalettes, they can often be worth more as a group than the individual parts, uh, particularly if the plan at some point may be to sell the, the, the portfolio to an investor. Mm. Um, we've, we've got a well-established hotel, so we're not, we're not spending huge amounts of time and effort 
um, at foundational level. So you pay a little bit of a premium for that mm. than if it was run down. But what a lot of people don't factor into, and this is another fundamental lesson, people don't often factor into the numbers, their time and their effort. Yeah. So sometimes it's worth buying a more established HMO, for instance, or a more established rental property, one that's done, that gives you a slightly less yield, but that you don't have to spend six months of every evening and weekend because you're working, doing it up and being there and the hassle and the, and the risk that the builder's going to be late and all of that. Sometimes it's worth buying that, paying that slight premium for someone else having done the hard work. So that's certainly where we are with this hotel. Um, and, um, you know, we've got, we've, we've built in a, a sizable chunk of equity, which within the two years we'll be able to release to repay our investors and they'll reinvest it with us to help us grow further. So, um, it's a very solid, reliable income stream. And because we're looking slightly medium to long term, we're not, we're not, you know, property investment's hard when you're short term, when you're trying to flip really quickly, or when you're when you're all about numbers right now. Whereas if you take a longer term view, you can sometimes afford to pay a little bit more. You know, everybody's trying to get property at twenty five percent below market value, but fifteen percent below market value can still be a great deal. Yeah. Um, but not if you not if your criteria is you have to pull your money out within six months. But six months is such a short period of space of time. So it's about knowing what your criteria is. We're in for the long term. And so this is a, a very solid, well established deal that delivers money that we can spend in Waitrose or Harrods at the end of the month. <laughs> fantastic i think that you you always come out with some some good points and that's one as well about accepting a little bit less yield to have something to have something done and it's something that when i'm looking at my deals and talking to my investors and they go how long is this going to be and i say 12 to 18 months and they go yeah, but you're going to get it finished in a lot less time than that you, yes but you're not factoring in everything that's the whole process of getting it planning converting the building finishing it and then letting it settle because yeah. it's always always gonna there's gonna be issues you know when you put brand new boiler in brand new sister system in it's been tested but then you put six people in who are all using the ensuite at the same time and then you've got another four over there using it and it's like it's going to go wrong um you just got to factor that in and that's a that is a cracker so what was the the biggest lessons then that that you've learned over over the last few deals yeah so great deals come from agents yep i think just like we got 21 hotels nine of which came from a single agent that tells you a lot we've got a brilliant relationship with that agent. we don't buy everything he gives to us Sometimes we're just not in a position to if we've just bought something else and our funding's out. So um, when we bought, we bought 474 properties in four years, 75% of them came from four agents. So agents are the key, without a doubt. If you want to do more deals, spend more time with agents, do more, um, do more networking, socialising. Mm. Just find the ones that, 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 that you build rapport with. Um, sorry, just one sec. Yep. Sorry, live TV. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, agents critical. Yep. Um, just, I don't know, to practically, if people are watching this and they're like, oh, that sounds good. Just spend every Friday afternoon going and networking with agents visiting them. I mean, they're, they're easy to find. They all, they, they, they all have, they all want to be at the side of each other. They're like pack animals. They're not, it's not difficult. None of this is difficult. Um, it's not, none of it is, is complicated. It's not always easy because people tell themselves, oh, it should be hard. And you go into agents sometimes and, and you'll meet someone who you just don't, mm. rapport's not there. They don't like you. They maybe got their mate already. Go back the next week when he's out at lunch and you meet, 
you know, instead of making Bob who does not like you, meet Susie who does. It's kind of, you just have to keep going. But you don't need, you know, one great agent has given us almost 50% of our hotel deals, just one. You don't need that. The second thing is funding's always available. So even though we lost the bank halfway through this deal, because the deal was good enough, funding was available with another bank. And, and what I say about funding is if you, if you can't get funding to your deal, the deal's not good enough, or you're not talking to the right people. That's it. That's the only reason, they're the only two reasons why you won't be able to get funding. Hmm. I wonder the, the deal's not good enough. It might not be that the deal's not good enough. It might just be that you've not presented it in the right way. So like the bank manager that put red pen on, my business plan wasn't presented in the way he helped me. Loads of people out there that will help you. Brokers will help you present your deals in a better way. Mm. Um, I have some templates, which, you know, spreadsheets and stuff that help people present deals in a, in a good way, which are free to anybody that wants them. But so if you can't get funding, the deal's not good enough, move on from it, or talk to another person, talk to another broker, find the broker, find another lender. Um, and then due diligence, you know, the three criteria I talked about, fundamental, um, know what those are. They don't have to be the same as us, you know, as our criteria, but know what they are because that will allow you to, you want to pick the needle out of the haystack. In order to pick the needle out of the haystack, you've got to know what the needle looks like, right? So you've got to be able to, fil uh, to, to filter it out. And then um, do deals that are doable. Do, you know, if you have this um, criteria for doing deals that you've got to, you know, I see people walk away from deals because they've got to leave £5,000 and, and they want all of their money out. And I just think, you know, five years from now, you wish you bought 50 of them. Yeah. Years from now, you wish you bought the whole street. So take a, take a slightly longer term view on deals, I would say is also another, another good criteria, a good lesson. Um, yeah, and, 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 and for us, buy for income. That's, I respect the developers out there. I, I, I do genuinely. I think if you are considering development, you know, whenever we did development, we always made sure, we always tried to build the kinds of properties that would rent in the event that we couldn't sell them. Mm. Because we're in an even more uncertain world. And I hate to mention Brexit and all that kind of stuff that's going on. But even without Brexit, there's always uncertainty. Mm. And people... People are talking about Brexit because it's in the news. It's, it's what they see, but there's a lot of stuff happening that people don't see that the news isn't aware of, you know, in the financial markets. and mm. So there's always going to be uncertainty. So if, if, if you're developing properties that you plan to sell in 18 months and you can't, can you rent them so you don't lose everything would mm. be for, the, for the developers that are watching? But... We don't do development, we buy for you. So. Mm. Fantastic. And you have been an absolute delight again. And I'm sure that this is just going to smash all the records. I wonder if it will beat your last podcast. So if, if people do want to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? A um, couple of websites. So shepherdcox.com. There's contact details on there. Uh, there's a website, nickcarlisle.com. Carlisle doesn't have an S. Um, LinkedIn. I'm fairly accessible. I don't, I don't hide anywhere. Fairly accessible. LinkedIn is a good place. Drop me a message. Um, I get back to everyone. Sometimes it takes me a little while. Just be persistent. Don't be offended if it takes me a little while. But I do try and get out. And, and, uh, and I do a bit of speaking as well. The events are on the nickcarlisle.com um, website. There's a few speaking events coming up where I just come and talk like this in front of an audience and I, I don't have anything to sell you know there's, I don't have a product or an education product I don't have I don't sell courses I don't do mentoring so I just try and I try and help people um, mm -hmm. in their journey um, but I think you've seen most of what I talk about I, I come from a point of view of common sense yeah it isn't as hard as it's often made out to be doesn't mean it's easy to do, but it's it's a lot simpler. The, the fundamentals are a lot simpler. So, mm. you know, I'd encourage anybody to, to get involved in property. Mm. Fantastic, and thank you, thank you for coming on, Nick. You've been an absolute pleasure. 
Brilliant. Well, thanks for bearing with me with the power and the and the visitor at the door. So no worries. Yeah, good to speak to you, and thanks for listening, everyone. And um, yeah, have a great day. <laughs>